Alright, my bedroom is in the blast zone of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. It's lowering the property values in and around our area, and I worry that I won't be able to move to a safer location when the, if the pipeline does come. And it's poisoning our groundwater and the local creeks and streams that my friends and I like to canoe and kayak in. You know, we're looking to start a citizen's movement of pipeline fighters to end eminent domain for private gain for these pipeline projects once and for all. And we really think the movement has already begun. You have pipeline fighters in Nebraska and Virginia, in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, in New York, in Pennsylvania. I mean, all across our country, individuals that are Republican, Democrats, independents, populists, conservatives, we're all standing together. Uh, my name is Russell Chisholm. We are outside the governor's offices here in Richmond, Virginia. And we're on day three of some peaceful action to basically get his attention about these dangerous pipeline projects. Why did you risk your own well-being to um, protest in front of the governor's mansion in his office building? Going back two years, I can remember at our earliest meetings, um, discussions that the possibility of taking this to this point, direct action, potentially getting arrested, um, was out there. Um, and I think one of the things that, that definitely uh, spurred me along um, to follow through with it, because it was kind of nerve-wracking, I don't know about you, but adrenaline <laughs> was really flowing that day, um, was seeing a video of where, he's, where the governor is talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings with these energy people and the pipeline builders, and, and I'm thinking, dozens of meetings? <laughs> dozens of meetings? And we can't get a meeting? He right. doesn't meet with delegations we've sent her before. We're talking to a blank wall. Even there, when we were there three days demonstrating, he, was, he deliberately left town. You know, he could have come out of his mansion and thanked us for coming and say he would, he's glad to hear our point of view. But right. what did he do? He has a press conference on the second day where he basically laughs that we're there saying there's a lot of demonstrations there. This is just one more demonstration. Right. So, I mean, he's arrogant. Uh, the, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, as you know, is a federal issue. It is not a state issue. We need politicians that actually have a backbone that actually believe in our constitutional right to own land, to protect land, to steward the land, um, where we won't be terrified that at any moment a pipeline company can come knocking on our door and say, guess what? You thought you owned this land? You don't own this land. We're gonna put a pipeline wherever we damn please. Um, I really looked at this particular action um, as um, an opportunity to make ourselves heard. Um, and when I say ourselves, I'm talking about the people who live down here in these sacrifice zones. Um, our neighbors, Joe and Donna, the, the Jones family, people like that. People who, um, for whatever reason, might not be in a position to go to Richmond and have themselves arrested. Um, but those people um, are being ignored. They're being ignored by the governor. They're being ignored by FERC. Evening, Governor. Do you oppose the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and Mountain Valley Pipeline? Why are you going in the back door, Governor? Will you look your citizens in the eye? When presented with an opportunity uh, to hold a meeting in his absence, essentially, on, on his doorstep, um, we, we had to kind of take that moment. You know, we had to seize that. Two, four, six, eight. strong motivation for me because I do love my country and, um, uh, and I want it to work properly is that this whole process of deciding whether to build pipelines through our communities or our state or these other states around the Marcellus is, is not a democratic process and there's no place for the people in the affected communities to have any voice in this process. There's a pretense that we have a voice but we've learned that it's all a charade. Right. It's all pro forma. And six, two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Russell! 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 By the time we get to the mansion, I'm in good spirits. I'm, it's, a, it's a cohesive feeling. We're, we're a group. We're united. We're supporting one another. And I lost all my fear. So why take direct action against our governor? Because we're locked out of the democratic process. We're locked out at the federal level because it's an independent regulatory association that does say we have all these 
opportunities for the public to speak about the impact on their communities. And we did that. Uh, and we, um, and now that we've read the draft environmental impact statement, we see that none of that, nothing that we did, the reports, the letters we wrote, um, made any difference. There's no reference to them in the draft environmental impact statement, which is the last document before the final draft environmental impact statement that leads to the granting of a certificate of necessity and convenience to the pipeline that lets them take our property through eminent domain. And it's getting to that point and seeing that all the work we've done for two years of working through institutions was for naught, and it doesn't even, re it isn't even reflected in their written decision-making process. What is there left for us to do but to go outside of the regular institutional process and go to Richmond and speak to our governor and, uh, and then get a ticket trying to talk to him and uh, wherever that's going to lead. Yes, I'll do it again. We really need to connect with the greater community, um, much the way that Standing Rock, Sioux, you know, ha have been able to raise awareness about the Dakota Access Pipeline. That started with a handful of people, um, and then it just grew and grew and grew into this, into this bigger movement. Uh, we need that kind of response down here. And I, I think it's going to happen in far southwest Virginia and with our neighbors over in West Virginia, um, where we're going to have to come up with uh, almost like a border stand um, against Mountain Valley Pipeline. The major issue there is that the Dakota Access Pipeline is trying to cross the Missouri River. Um, they want to drill underneath the Missouri River and put a, a pipeline under the Missouri that's going to deliver crude oil from the Bakken oil field to a refinery in Chicago, Illinois. To this point, there's been uh, close to 100 arrests of uh, peaceful, prayerful water protectors. The uh, state of North Dakota has called a state of emergency and asked for extra re additional resources from the United States government. Um, they brought in National Guard to form a checkpoint and roadblock on Highway 1806 south of Bismarck and Mandan. Um, the, the county sheriff department has called the uh, National Sheriff's Association and asked for additional resources and more manpower. There's been over 200 agencies involved. Um, as always, we are unarmed and always in, in prayer and in peace and just trying to protect the water, not only for our people, but for the 18 million American citizens that get their drinking water from the Missouri River. This is not a, a, a native issue. Um, they try to say that this is an Indian uprising or this is just a native issue, but this is a human rights issue. This is also a national security issue. When there's that many million, millions of American citizens, that's water has uh, the potential to be contaminated that, that makes it a national security issue. Water is life! 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 The Obama administration has asked DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, to voluntarily stop within 20 miles of the river, stop construction. Um, a federal judge did grant a temporary restraining order, um, which has now been revoked and uh, the injunction has been lifted. So they are continuing to, con to construct up to the river. Um, we hope that we can have the fortitude to stay in this fight through a North Dakota winter. We're trying to winterize and uh, you know, it's one of my biggest fears that we may lose somebody to exposure but the people aren't willing to, to stand down. The people are going to stand strong on Standing Rock and, and continue this fight to stop corporate greed and stop the contamination of the Missouri River. I think it's easy to just separate that, to say, well, it's just a pipeline. But that pipeline is connected to huge fracking fields, or that pipeline is connected to huge tar sands fields. And the only way that we stop the development of the tar sands and fracking is if we stop pipelines. I think if we can get from a point where something is seemingly insignificant as one or two people getting arrested for this can lead to a much larger movement, then I think it will have been absolutely worth it. I agree. Um, 
Standing Rock gives us hope because um, Native Americans organized to oppose that pipeline and another case of the XL pipeline. Thousands and thousands of ordinary citizens protested that pipeline by going to the line with their bodies and standing there and opposing it and they were arrested. And that brought, up, that brought the attention of that matter to the national public opinion and the President of the United States ultimately decided against that pipeline. Definitely corporate gain involved here, part of MVP's statement about why they quote unquote need it because they have the customers, right? They say, well, we have customers for the pipeline, so the customers need the pipeline. Well, it turns out the customers are themselves, right? The builders of the pipeline are also the customers of the pipeline. This is self-dealing at its worst sort. You know, the biggest thing that we learned on the pipeline was that you had to get people out from behind their computer desks and off of the farms and ranches to come together in community and to do things with their hands. So they weren't only writing letters to the president, super critical, or only writing emails to the State Department, but that we were building a sense of community. And you do that through actions, like the folks here in Virginia in painting the trees. For us in Nebraska, that was building a solar barn inside the pipeline route. And I think that those creative actions actually do stop pipelines. You know, we are pipeline fighters. We're water keepers. We're people of the land who are standing up to big corporations. And, it, and that is their worst nightmare. The only thing that is going to stop these pipelines is the people standing shoulder to shoulder, despite differences of politics and everything else that, may, that they may try to use to divide us. They call them the seeds of resistance because they symbolize the resistance to the destruction of Mother Earth. The corporate greed, the resistance to corporate greed. We want to save our land for our future generations, bottom line. We want our children and our grandchildren to be able to, to live in balance and harmony with Mother Earth. I've worked all my life to pay for my farm if they want to run a gas line through the middle of it destroy ancient oak trees, sacred Indian burial grounds. Not one entity has stopped the pipeline or any pipeline without going to court or unless it was presidential decree. Now we're on the X, on the X Keystone XL <laughs> pipeline <Yay>! route. <laughs> it's been wonderful since the president rejected that. My wife and I, we now actually smile once in a while. You know, we can laugh and we can sleep at night. But there's part of us that said the job's not done. And part of that job is right here in West Virginia. You know, we deeply believe in all these pipeline fights across the country that there's three ways that we can beat them. The first is to end imminent domain for private gain. There is absolutely no reason in America that a private corporation can come in and tell an American citizen that they're gonna take land against their will. So we gotta stop that at the state level and the federal level. The second is a climate test. You know, President Obama, for the first time in our country's history, and so far it's been the only time, used a climate test on a piece of fossil fuel infrastructure, and that was on the Keystone XL pipeline. And it was one of the big reasons that Keystone XL was rejected, was because the State Department and all the other federal agencies assessed that pipeline and said, how will this impact climate change? If it's going to increase climate change, we're going to reject it. And so we've told the president that if a climate test is good for Nebraska, a climate test is good for Virginia, a climate test is good for West Virginia, a climate test is good for Pennsylvania. And there is a website up called climatetest.org that lays out this policy position to really start making folks understand that this is one other way that we can stop these pipelines. And the third way is local permits. You know, in New York, the Constitution pipeline was rejected because of an obscure local permit around water. And we can use these local permits as a way to stop these pipelines. And all of these things, you know, stopping imminent domain, climate test, and local permits has to be done with an unlikely alliance. If it's just the environmentalists, if it's just the landowners, if it's just the young people, if it's just the faith leaders, they will divide and conquer. That's the best thing for oil, big oil and big gas. But if we all come together, the cowboys and Indians, the farmers, the ranchers, the landowners, the mountain people, if we continue to stand shoulder to shoulder, that's when we win. If we, if we allow them to build these pipes, it'll be the place where 
gas production growth is going to come from in the United States. No other place has the potential to double production in the next five or ten years. That's what they want to do. They've already increased it a thousand percent since since 2006. So we're going to be making that case about the 18 to 20 pipelines that are being proposed to expand that gas production. Mountain Valley is in fact the biggest of, of those, at 2 billion cubic feet a day. And we've taken that report and we've uh, promoted it to the environment movement more widely in the United States, you know, the big green groups, Sierra Club, etc. And they're saying, you know, enough is enough, we cannot build any more of these projects. The impact of gas is, is too great, we cannot solve the climate issue by building more fossil fuel infrastructure. So we also took the report to the White House. We took it, we took it to CEQ. Now the administration has led in uh, implementing the Paris Agreement, bringing other parties to the table. And the Paris Agreement was ratified uh, just last week by India and the European Union. US and China have already ratified and that means the agreement comes into force on November 4th. It's now this, this US federal government's policy to work towards keeping climate change well below two degrees as, and pursuing 1.5 degrees, that's in the Paris Agreement. Let's file in, in local court, let's file in state court, and file in federal court. What have you got to lose? And if that judge turns it down, go to another one. Find a sympathetic judge and ask for a stay and try to stop it dead in its tracks. This is what's happened in Delaware. The trout people delayed, the deer hunters delayed, and oh, they just kept pounding and pounding and pounding. The, the biggest thing that I've learned is that it, it doesn't take a, a huge action to make a difference. It takes a uh, community coming together, uh, neighbors standing arm in arm. Amen, horse. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. We needed to hear what you just said. <laughs> They rely on us thinking everybody, we can't. Everybody done, yep. just, just prove the naysayers wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My people have a connection to the land. We, we've been the stewards to the land for time immemorial. But the people that are here now have buried their fathers, have buried their mothers in this land. They've buried their loved ones. Some have buried their children in this land. They have a connection to the land the same as we have a connection to the land. When I look around here in the mountains, what a beautiful place it is. And the water, it's so pure and clean. Um, I don't have that where I live anymore. The, the place where I live is polluted. What you have here it is paradise on earth and, and it's worth protecting and it's worth fighting for. So I'm here to stand with, with this community and this county to tell them that they're not alone. It really helped my heart to feel like there is hope that we can fight this pipeline and fight someone who's so much bigger than us and seems so much more powerful, especially when they prayed over this corn and called down the power of the Great Spirit. It gave me strength. We need a federal end to imminent domain for private gain for fossil fuel projects, in particular pipelines. And we have to start protecting state property rights as well for the pipelines that are already in the ground, making sure that these pipeline companies are responsible for digging up that pipeline when it's at its end use and for making sure that when spills happen, liability doesn't shift onto landowners. These pipeline fights have been uh, real catalysts in our communities because, you know, th this is now not just happening you know, somewhere else. And that's how we're going to win, by increasingly, you know, learning from each other and sticking together and standing up with our neighbors and fighting. This is a historic time. Um, not only is this the first time since the Battle of the Little Bighorn that the, the Sioux Nation, the uh, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota Seven Council Fires has been together, which is known as the Osheti Sankowi the first time that they've been together since the Battle of the Little Bighorn, but this is the first time in history that 300 indigenous nations have come together to stand in solidarity for, for one cause. And so it's not only a, a awakening of indigenous people and awareness and a, and a time of, of renewal of our rights as indigenous people uh, to live on the land and protect the land and water and uh, our natural resources, but it's a global awakening and it's a time of um, a 
awareness for people around the globe that are saying no to fossil fuels and that it's time to move into the future of renewable energies and stop polluting the land, stop polluting the water and stop polluting the air. And that's what we're standing for at Standing Rock. I just got a text. A landowner just got arrested on her own land um, today when they were doing an action because they said that she was trespassing on her own land. Hundreds of maple trees are cut, destroying the Holleran family business started in 1950. The Constitution Pipeline is exercising their right of eminent domain granted by the FERC. Tree cutters are escorted by a dozen state police and heavily armed U.S. Marshals carrying assault weapons. Catherine Holleran said, they refused to see us as people and brought guns to our home. In New York, the State Department of Environmental Conservation refused to grant the company's request for water quality certification under the Clean Water Act. So although the Constitution pipeline now stands blocked, the Holleran's trees are gone. What's happening is the pipeline companies are really saying that now people on the ground, citizens, Native Americans, elders, are armed militia, is how they're describing them to the federal government in order to use stricter fines when they arrest them for doing nonviolent civil disobedience. One of the most troubling things happening right now is that our journalists are getting arrested. And so Amy Goodwin with Democracy America and Josh Fox's film producer both recently got arrested when they were filming a citizen protest. All they were doing was their job. As the free press, they were documenting an action. They were reporting the news. And what is happening is that they're not just getting kind of arrested and then let go and pay a $50 fine. They're getting trumped up charges of felony trespassing and they're now being threatened with up to 45 years in jail all for doing reporting and journalism. And for me, what this tells me is that the oil and gas industry know that they're on their last string. And one of the last things they have left is to jail our members of the media and to use fear and intimidation to citizens to make us stop acting. And the reality is we're pipeline fighters. We're not stopping because we know we're on the right side of history. You know, I'm happy to be part of the pipeline fighter movement and I'm confident that we're gonna get this done. Governor McAuliffe promised that he was going to tackle climate change, that he was going to be one of our nation's green governors, and yet you can't continue to build fossil fuel infrastructure and pretend that you're tackling climate change. And so we have a very clear message to Governor McAuliffe. Stop siding with the polluters and start siding with the people. He's not listening to the people who don't want the frack gas pipelines, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So we brought those voices to his house so he can finally hear these voices of his own citizens, his own vo voters who want solar panels, not pipelines. They want clean energy, climate justice, not corporate control over their land, the seizing of their property. They're fed up, they've had enough, and they brought their message straight to the governor today. Your voice matters. My voice matters. Our kids' voices matter. Don't ever let somebody tell you that a march does not matter. Politicians hate when you put political pressure on them in the public. They hate when you go to their front door and surround mansions. They hate when you write letters. They hate when you show up to the state capitol demanding no eminent domain for private gain. Governor, start supporting Virginia and not Dominion. And so let's today remember that we are putting pressure on Governor McCullough. And we won't take it anymore. Changing laws to suit your influence.